Okay, so it is now officially 10 o'clock, so we will get underway on time. Um, before we kick off, uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping points, if I can ask that you all pop yourselves on mute if you haven't done so already, already, just to minimize any distractions during this morning's webinar, that would be great. And also to confirm that we are recording this session and it will be made available <clears throat> after today. Okay, so as way of introduction, uh, my name is Rob Lovegrove. I'm the head of digital at Roland, and I wanted to thank you for joining us to, uh, for today's webinar. Uh, it's my absolute uh, pleasure and privilege to be co-hosting today's session on behalf of Roland with our friends from Agenic, specifically Angel Chan and Danielle Sinkus. I say it's a privilege because our two firms have known each other uh, for many years, but we've taken the relationship one step further this year by formalizing a partnership between our respective organizations. Uh, it was a pretty logical step as we've uh, got complementary skills and backgrounds, which in this data-driven age means we can hopefully provide added depth, rigor, and outcomes for you, our clients, and friends of our respective firms. To showcase where we thought our different skill sets might overlap, we thought today's topic uh, which is titled How to Combine Public Sentiment with Business Data to Manage Your Brand, Stakeholders and Business Performance was a pretty good one. Like us, I'm sure all of you have a pressing need to either better understand or to evolve data and business intelligence opportunities and strategies. Talking from personal experience, I often find that organizations use data to tell them what's happened, but often it lacks the critical so what. How do we use this data to predict or inform our next actions? In terms of today's session, this is what it looks like. In a moment, I'll briefly put Roland into context for those of you who don't know us, and then I'll pass on to Angel, who will do the same for Genic. She and Danny will then lead us through the first of two examples where we can demonstrate how we each use different data sets or a different lens looking at data, including sentiment analysis to deliver strategic outcomes for our clients. In the second half of the webinar, Agenic's Kelly DeWitts will facilitate a question and answer session. So with that in mind, as we're talking this morning, please don't hesitate to use the chat function to type any questions or insights you may have. And myself, Angel and Danny will do our best to answer them or comment on them. Uh, for those of you on desktop, uh, the chat function, if you wriggle over the, your screen, should appear at the very bottom center of the screen. So without any further ado, very quickly, who are Roland and Agenic? Uh, well, Roland is a commu corporate communication, digital and creative agency that was founded by our chairman, Jeff Rogers, in 1992, which makes us that far off being 30 years old. I'm very proud to say that I've been at Roland for exactly half that time, 15 years, and it's gone very, very quickly. But in that time, our business, like so many others, has had to evolve to meet the changing communication landscapes, not more so than with the advent of social and digital media. I'm equally as proud to say that Roland developed the first ever social strategy for McDonald's back in uh, 2005. It was the first strategy for them uh, anywhere in the world. And we've delivered a number of other firsts within our industry since then, as we've gone on to put more emphasis on delivering efficiencies through digital platforms. That's evolved to where we are today. As an organization, we've put immense value in underpinning our communication, digital and creative services with data putting context around advice, applying tangible metrics to outcomes, where once upon a time, perhaps we'd be measured by press clippings or perhaps even the opposite, keeping clients out of the media. We've been delivering sentiment analysis reporting for about five to six years now. And it's through this service that we've come to appreciate the capabilities and skills that Agenic bring to the table in terms of data interpretation. So with that in mind, I'd like to pass on to Angel to talk about Agenic and to kickstart us with our first example. Perfect. Thanks very much, Rob. And hello, it's it's really good to have you all on the line. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so as Rob mentioned, I'm Angel Chan, the CEO of Agenic. And Agenic as a company specializes in data. More specifically, we love to transform and really change the way people experience and use the data they have. Because reality is these days, most of our clients have mountains of data already. It's not the lack of data that's the issue. It's just that the data often isn't as usable or as useful as it can be. And that can be because there are too many systems and sources of truth. It can be because people have trouble getting access to the data in the first place. Or it can be because organizations have invested in building out dashboards and analytics and so on. But those things aren't getting as much traction as they could be because they don't answer the user's most burning questions when they have them or because the people don't trust the data. 
And what that means is that the right data often isn't there at the hands of the people who need it when they need it the most. And as a bunch of data geeks at Agenic, we think that there's a better way to, to kind of tackle this. And our core business therefore involves helping our clients build the capability to use data in more intuitive, accessible ways. And that can be from, you know, setting up more modern data solutions and ways of working with data, or it can be jumping in to actually help with analysis of you know, how to solve tricky business problems, how to improve business performance. So doing analytical or data science work. And we've worked with clients from Queensland Health through to Flight Centre. It's been um, quite a journey as, as technology and data use has evolved across the industry. But we're very excited about our partnership with Roland because we think it'll help us make an even bigger impact for our clients because we can draw on Roland's expertise to link the data insights through to specific brand marketing, communication and product strategies. And those can have a really tangible business impact. So as Rob mentioned, today we'll kick off with a few examples of, of how we've done this in the past or how we think we, you know, it can be done. And our first example today shows how quantitative data, like product sales trends and, and, and so on, can be used alongside qualitative data like public sentiment <laughs> to respond to a major market disruption and create a more nuanced strategies for kind of market and recovery and growth. So for the wine lovers among you, um, you might know that wine has been really skyrocketing as an export market for Australia. So 20 years ago, it was about 200 million. These days, it's hovering at around the $3 billion mark. For quite a long time now, China was and actually still is our biggest market. And it accounts for over 30% of our sales by value. Um, but you might also be aware that late last year in November, China introduced some import tariffs of up to around 200%. And that's hit the wine industry really hard, especially when combined with the effects of COVID, which has impacted tourism, you know, visitations, and, and just people, the way people consume. So with the geopolitical tensions kind of continuing on and the Chinese market looking pretty unpredictable, it makes sense for Australian wine growers and exporters to focus on other countries. And that includes, you know, the UK and the US, which are the next two biggest markets for Australia. And also other smaller emerging markets, particularly in Asia. But each of these countries has different preferences, demographics, culture, and different ways of really just talking about wine and consuming it. And so once a one size fits all strategy won't really work in this situation. And it makes sense to use data to create a more nuanced and, and a more nuanced strategy that's tailored to each market and even to subsections of these markets. So Danielle Simkus from our team will now take everyone through an example of how to do that by, by combining data from two sources. One is publicly available market insights um, on a data portal that's um, run by Wine Australia and, and, and Agenic as a company will be helped build that portal. Second data source is public sentiment data, which we're analyzing through our social listening platform NetBase. Danny, over to you. Hello everyone, thank you for joining this morning and thank you to Angel and Rob for that introduction. Um, yeah, we're very excited to to talk through an example of how I guess we would use um, the quantitative and qualitative data from both the Eugenic and the Roland side to help define some strategies. Um, so I'm actually going to switch over now into a, um, I guess more of a live demo. Uh, is everyone able to see a dashboard currently? Or well, Angel, if you can nod. I know I can. Awesome. Perfect, okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is um, one of the dashboards that we produced alongside of Wine Australia towards the end of last year. Uh, it was a, a very, a very awesome project to be working on um, while the China tariffs were being implemented. Um, so it was cool to see that the data that we were producing and visualising was actually directly usable for Wine Australia. So this dashboard as a whole, it's showing the exports to... Um, different markets globally. So for this main overview page, we can choose uh, filters such as uh, where the wine is coming from. So is the wine being grown in Queensland or in Tasmania, for example, um, and also where the wine is going to. So if I just remove that, you can see and select any of the uh, countries globally. Uh, we also here, we can actually update what 
uh, what data we're actually seeing. Um, so please ignore that uh, visual. <laughs> so we can actually see that um, we're looking at data that's ending in 2021, March. I'll just wait for this to reload. Uh, so for the overview dashboard, we're able to see varieties. Um, we're able to see um, the destination market as well as where that wine is coming from. So if I wanted to look at a wine market, for example, the United Kingdom, which has uh, had the largest percentage increase of exports over the last year, um, you will see that the um, total volume exported to the United Kingdom was 264 million. Um, and as we can see here, that still red was the greatest uh, export to the United Kingdom. Um, on this next tab, we're able to actually have a little bit of a better, a, lot, a more detailed look at the markets that we're exporting to. So if I select here again, the United Kingdom, we can actually see um, the market share by exporter size. So the exporter size here is in referring to um, the actual size, the actual volume of wine that these exporters are exporting. So for example, it could be um, from less than 10,000 nine litre cases up to more than 100,000 nine litre cases. On the right hand side, we're able to see the number of active exporters for that current market. Uh, so this is for the United Kingdom. You'll see here that the number of active exporters um, that actually commenced exporting during the last year was um, 73. If we scroll down to the bottom of the page, we're actually able to see the number that commenced exporting and the number that ceased exporting. What's really interesting about this is that you can get a gauge of how competitive the market is for exporters. And by doing this, the uh, markets are able to, uh, I guess the exporters are able to define more complex and more um, thorough marketing strategies that can help them target and enter these markets. So seeing here that the, um, in the UK, they had about a 20, 20 ex, uh, as you can see, 20 exporters, actually 20 more exporters, sorry, ceased exporting than commenced exporting. Um, so by using some of the data that I'm about to show you, these exporters can balance out and hopefully increase the number that are actually commencing exporting to the UK. From here, we can also have a look at the United States of America and see any changes that might occur. So um, as I scroll down to this bottom table again, you'll see that the United States has actually had the same number of uh, exporters exporting to, uh, that commenced exporting, sorry, and also the same number that ceased exporting. Again, highlighting that the market can be quite competitive in that there were 74 that did stop exporting in the last year. Um, but you'll also uh, notice that the US market is actually like there, there's probably a little bit more opportunity in the UK market as a lot of those exporters that were already going to be exporting to the UK can actually um, look at their strategies and improve how they're doing this and continue to export. So one, now that we've kind of got a bit of a context about how the US and the UK markets are working, uh, we can actually go to have a look at different how different varieties might be influencing um, this export. So if I go to this uh, next tab on the dashboard, you'll see at the top here, it's showing the um, value and the percentage change for different varieties of wine. Uh, as you can, um, at the top, we can actually select. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm actually going to show the volume, um, all of these measures in volume rather than value. And the reason for that is that value, as a lot of us are aware, red wine can actually be more expensive than white wine. And I wanna get more of a standardized um, idea of the volume that's being actually exported to these markets. So if I change to the volume, you'll see that the um, United Kingdom and the United States both had the greatest um, volume of wine imported to them last year. Unsurprising that China has dropped down and that is due to the tariffs and also some COVID factors. When we have a look at this, we can actually see that the United Kingdom had um, positive percentage changes in each variety, whereas the United States of America actually had a negative change in still white and still rosé. However, we also see a huge increase in the sparkling and carbonated wine. So I guess now that we've had a look at the quantifiable data, so the, num the actual numbers that we're seeing in these markets, um, I'm actually going to switch now into NetBase, which is, um, as um, I think 
Rob and Angel have alluded to earlier is a social media listening tool, uh, which allows you to ingest basically social media data from Instagram, Facebook, um, Reddit, uh, TikTok, I think you can even ingest now as well um, and have a look at how the public is actually perceiving um, some of these topics. So for the first visualization I have here is a cross tab between the UK and the US um, Australian wine um, topics. So basically this is these topics have been sent up, set up using uh, really basic terminology such as looking for keywords um, including Australian wine, wine Australia, and then wine or Australia in the same sentence. Um, so the idea here is to just get a broad understanding about how these markets are perceiving our wine. So here we're, along the top, we've got the different types of wine. So we've got a red, white, rosé and sparkling. Um, if you recall in the dashboard that we were looking at earlier, um, the US actually had a dramatic increase in uh, sparkling. I think it was over 400% increase in sparkling wine imports. Um, which you can actually see here that um, the, the highest number in this chart is 86. So this, this chart is actually referring to what we call net sentiment. And this is, um, I guess, the positives and the negatives um, and the language that people are using to talk about these topics. So green and really high um, means that people are saying very positive things about wine. And it's great to see that in general across both Australia, both the UK and the US, there is a huge positive um, conversation around Australian wine. So um, another thing I'd like to point out on this uh, on this visualization is something that could be used to help define marketing strategies. It's just it's also very interesting to see that rosé and sparkling have got two of the highest net sentiment scores for the UK um, followed by red and then followed by white. Um, this data actually matches up with the export numbers themselves for the volume. So if I have a look at the United Kingdom, you'll find that the greatest percentage change was rosé and carbonated, um, followed by red and white. Uh, so it's really interesting to see that the net sentiment itself that people are talking, like the, the conversations that, we're, that we are having on social media is actually directly relating to the, um, the um, percentage change or the increases of volume of wine that's been to these markets. Using NetBase, we're actually able to gain a couple of other insights as well. Um, so we can use the demographics tab here to have a look at who it is who are having these conversations. Um, so for this first one, I actually have uh, the US selected as the market that I'm analyzing currently. Um, you'll notice that most of the conversation is happening for people above the age of 55. Um, and then this, uh, this can then um, help us target our strategies more when we are looking at import like are looking at increasing imports to these markets. Um, if I change to the UK you'll also see that um, the age group above 55 is the most prevalent in terms of who is talking about um, our wine as well. Another insight that you can get from NetBase um, is actually looking at sentiment drivers. Um, so I mentioned sentiment earlier before as well. Um, so some sentiment, as you will see here, um, if it's kind of a more positive, positive word, um, it'll be contributing to the positive side. And then if it's a more negative word, maybe like overpriced, for example, it will go towards the um, negative sentiment. In general, we already know that there is quite a positive drive. Um, what we can also have a look at in this word cloud uh, in the sentiment drivers is actually things like the emotions, behaviors and things. Um, so if I actually, I'm still currently looking at attributes, but uh, if I then change to things, for example, for uh, the UK, um, you can start to see um, some of the keywords coming out. If I change to the US in particular, you'll actually start to see some of the regions that we export from uh, come out as key terms that are being used in the conversations that drive social media. Um, so things like, for example, the Barossa Valley and also the Margaret River, which are two of our um, greatest um, regions for wine exports. Um, again, this is something that we can use to help target our communication strategies in order to increase our exports. Uh, another way that we can use NetBase is actually by looking at a word cloud. So very similar concept to a sentiment driver in that you're still picking out keywords or key things from the conversations. 
However, here I'd like to point out in this word cloud specifically for the UK itself, and we can start to see some of our wine brands coming through as a uh, conversation. So here we've got the, uh, we've got Yolamba and there's also Penfolds, which is a very popular export for Australian wine. If I click on Yolamba here, you'll start to see some sound bites that are coming out, which gives us a little bit more of an in insight into what people are actually saying about this wine. From here, we can actually start to pull some, even some hashtags itself. Um, but there's been some pretty awesome conversation um, generated in these sound bites about the particular um, particular wines that Australia is exporting. Uh, and finally, another fun way to have a look at, um, I guess, social media sentiment and how that can define our strategy is looking at what the influencers are saying. So what the people who post a lot or have a lot of followers are actually saying about our wine and how can we use that to define some of our strategies? One thing that I do find really interesting um, is if you have a look at the US, um, the US market and we scroll down to um, this post here. So this has been posted by the um, National Security Council in the United States. Um, and basically last year, they posted a comment saying um, that they were using Australian wine at the White House uh, holiday reception um, in order to celebrate um, yeah, Australian wine and also um, encourage others to do the same. So. It's pretty awesome to see that type of conversation happening and you see these little hashtags coming out that could potentially be used for further digital uh, drivers going forward. So that's the, um, the end of the, I guess, live demo portion of the presentation. I'm now gonna pass over to Rob who might wrap up a little bit more about what, how Roland could contribute to, uh, this, uh, to these strategies and also to talk through his next example. Sure, thanks, Danny. Um, just staying on Wine Australia, I can give that uh, some more context as well from a communication lens, I guess. So we have um, been using this type of data for a live project with uh, the federal government uh, where we're looking at uh, in-country sentiment towards Australian produce. Um, not surprisingly, wine being one of the primary exporting produce from Australia, this has been a, a huge value to us and my team when we've been looking at how we can assess this type of data with sentiment. And Danny's just given us a really great run through of how NetBase has worked. Um, I have to say, I probably look um, with NetBase through a slightly different lens, being a communicator and ex-journalist, I've probably got quite a pessimistic view of the world and I as much like to see what the negative commentary is towards particular produce and products as well, because as we, those of us who are communicators who are online this morning will know, um, you have as many irrational as you do rational conversations through digital channels. And so in this post-truth world, thank you, uh, President Trump, uh, facts only go so far and we can see how facts can be manipulated quite easily. So often when I look through sentiment like what Danny's just taken us through, I'm, I'm trying to delve into what some of the negative references are from detractors. And in this instance, when I was looking at the uh, commentary towards Australian wine in the UK market, for example, You'd expect the recent uh, free trade agreement to be a great cause of celebration. There's pictures and, and footage of Scott Morrison and Boris Johnson sharing uh, Tim Tams and penguins and having cups of PGT and, and glasses of uh, Jacob's Creek wine. And it's all being presented in a very uh, positive way through traditional media. Just to touch on what Danny was talking about before, it's important to note that NetBase also covers traditional media as well and the associated commentary that comes in through traditional media. Um, what we tend to look at is we can start to see where the more rational conversations are occurring, perhaps through traditional journalists. And then when we look at the more social side through Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth, it can sometimes paint a slightly different picture. And in this instance, it was interesting, or at least I found it interesting to see that there was a big movement by detractors, detractors of the Brexit movement, those who wanted to remain, were using the actual cheaper importing of Australian wine as a negative. They were trying to belittle the Brexiters by saying, oh, great, we've left you up all for what for some cheap Australian wine. So in that instance there, we were looking at the nuance in which the commentary was being made to see what the potential negative would be. So that when we come to create campaigns or create small C campaigns or communication programs, we've always got to have a mind out or an eye out for where that's 
that tremor might occur, where that potential little uh, issue might occur and blow up out of nowhere. So I think from our perspective, it's been really great to work with the genic on this instance to be able to marry up actual hard quantifiable data with the soft data around what people are saying, um, as much about the positives as it is the negative. So now we're moving into a phase whereby we can start to plan. And can I say, usually when we're looking at, high, um, at uh, sentiments, we are creating what we call a hypothesis. So this is data that we believe to be true. It's pointing this in a direction. This is data from a set period of time. With NetBase, we go back two years. We can get the trends. We can look at an analysis of how different conversations occur over time. And at that one moment in time, or it could be in the last month, the last week, whatever the case might be, that is what we believe to be true. That's the topic of conversation at that given time. So what we look to do is use that as a hypothesis to say, this is what we believe uh, we should be targeting moving forward in terms of either demographics, personas, and topics of conversation. We might just flick on to the next uh, example now. Thanks, Danny, if you still got control, thank you. Um, this second example is a funny one in as much as I've got to be a little bit coy about how I present this. Um, not always the case, but with Roland, a lot of the times when we're looking at sentiment, it can be around a lot of uh, negative sentiment or some detractors, uh, detractor commentary. So what we're, I'm gonna talk through now in this second example is a project for a, uh, a sporting body, a sporting organization. Uh, in this instance, they uh, believe to have had uh, probably three or four main issues pertaining to that sport. Uh, they were moving into a, a three year strategic sort of planning uh, phase to tr really try and present their brand to market in a positive light, acknowledging that there was three to four key issues affecting the sport. They wanted to uh, really understand uh, one core thing. What was it that was actually driving the conversation online? So the first uh, report, first of two reports, and the second one was a really interesting one, but for the first report, it was probably typical of how Roland would approach sentiment analysis. We did um, a search around that sporting code. We looked at all the references over a two year period. We looked at the peaks and the troughs. We started to analyze if the commentary was assigned to particular sporting events taking place. How far out from that sporting event? Was it a week before? Was it a month before? Was it the day before? Was it on the day? And we can, as Danny's alluded to, we can then break down demographics, who's having those conversations, the age ranges, do they marry up with those who are likely to be attending the events or are these third parties trying to, from the peanut gallery, throw uh, slurs and to throw mud at the sporting organisation from afar. That report was, as I said, pretty standard for Roland. It, it was able to present a really compelling message, though, for this organisation. As I said, they were going into a phase where they were trying to uh, present a three-year horizon for the business. And it was looking to be quite complex because they had all the positives whilst managing the negatives. What we were able to demonstrate categorically um, was that there were two critical issues, not the four that they perceived to be. Yes, there were two or three others that were appearing, but the issue that was in third place, as it were, made up, I think, from memory, about 3% of the conversation. It wasn't as big an issue as they perceived to be. Now, I said I use the word category. That's probably wrong on my part. Again, we use this as a hypothesis. I think in this instance, we were monitoring around about 5 million references within Australia towards this particular sporting organisation. From my mind's eye, um, that is a really effective volume of, 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 of data to be assessing. It's not like we've gone to a focus group of 12 people and we've got 12 people's uh, comments or thoughts. We're trying to look through five million references here and it's probably worth noting this point we're obviously not going through this uh, uh, with a fine tooth comb from a human perspective we're letting the machine learning put the references into context and then we're coming in to clean the data as best we can and of course we've got to try and look out for our own bias when we're actually cleaning the data and making our own interpretation and so in that instance that first report really helped the organization to refine and define their strategic intent for the coming three years. It saved them an awful lot of time and an awful lot of head uh, heartache trying to articulate every single aspect of that uh, sporting organization. The second report was really interesting. And thanks, Danny, if you can click onto the next uh, slide. This is, um, it was an interesting way in which we used uh, the NetBase platform. 
This was the first time we tried to do something like this, and I have to say it worked out extraordinarily well. So the way in which we approach data analysis can give you slightly different outcomes, where the first report was very much a communication lens. The second was more around business intelligence and business growth. So with this sporting organization, they have bricks and mortar uh, venues. The sporting events themselves, probably not surprisingly, drive the vast volume of revenue. But what is the opportunity outside of those sporting events to continue to drive revenue um, in an events environment? In this instance, we ran a report uh, looking at multiple codes, sporting codes, and I'm showing you some of them on screen now. Uh, we also looked beyond just sports codes. We looked at other events and venues, so things like um, uh, the theatre, music festivals, uh, social precincts. So here in Brisbane, for example, places like uh, How Smith Wars, for example, or Jane Street. And then we looked at specifically, we asked uh, through a Boolean query, we asked the platform to search for verbs around people's intent to visit or go to or plan an event. And so by doing this, we were able to see again what it was that were, was a driver for people attending the physical venue. So when we start to look at places like Suncorp Stadium, Goma for music events or theatre, we're looking to see if it's specifically tied to the event that it's famous for. In many instances, and I'll take um, Suncorp as a great example, if there was a test match on or there was a soccer match, whatever the case might be, what we found was, was that the sporting event was part of the reason for attending, but the actual ecosystem, physical ecosystem, the geographic ecosystem surrounding the location was as important to create the atmosphere. So from a Suncorp uh, perspective, it was about people going to before or after Caxton Street. And that was as much about the conversations that were taking part about meeting up at the, the Caxton beforehand and then going down an hour later or meeting up with friends post the event to commiserate or to celebrate or whatever the case might be. In this instance, we use this to be able to present to the same sporting organization a bit of a, a breadth of uh, uh, planning around how they should look to engage other uh, businesses or other cafes, restaurants uh, within their precincts to be able to build an atmosphere, A, firstly around sports events and meets that were taking place, but then beyond that, what was the propensity for people to attend events around things like engagements, birthday parties, and so on and so forth. And often it was around atmosphere, not surprisingly, that really was the leading reason for attending an actual venue as well as the capabilities of the size and scale of said venues. So in that instance, we used uh, NetBase in this instance beyond just a communication perspective, but a reason to really start to articulate how they can start to build their business and who they should be targeting their actual business generating uh, opportunities through. And in this, in this case, can I say, what we found was that where there is a female leaning uh, positive sentiment towards attending or planning events, we saw a greater propensity for conversation. So in that instance, we've suggested, and our hypothesis, and I stress, is that in this instance, if they're looking to expand beyond the sporting events, that they start to channel their communication through tone and language, their visuals towards a more younger female audience. So perhaps we're looking at hens parties or engagement parties and so on and so forth as the catalyst to start to see how these uh, event venues or venues can be expanded beyond the sporting events. So, I thought that was a pretty interesting way to, again, put a different lens over uh, the data interpretation of sentiment. And it might be worth at this point, but I'm not sure if Angel or Danny, um, this was kind of where it sort of, it's, it's uh, given us an opportunity to think about how Roland and Agenic can come together to start to think about other data sets that could be used to expand on the hypothesis, to be able to build out what could be a, a small C campaign to test what we believe to be true. So I'm not sure if, Maybe, Angel, you've got any thoughts about any of the data sets that we could use in this instance? Absolutely. And I think when we we're talking about this with Rob, we talked about what types of data the organization would typically already have. And obviously that includes sales data, but not just high level sales volumes and so on, but potentially segmented by different types of customers they have. That might be season pass holders versus people buying tickets to once off games. It might be people who buy tickets in groups, which might suggest, you know, groups of friends, families and so forth. And with that kind of data, especially if 
um, the sporting body has seen trends in their demographics over time, that could be a really useful way to cross validate um, the sentiment related analysis and also to identify maybe potential other lines of investigation and other hypotheses worth testing. Um, if the body has run their own marketing campaigns or maybe engage an agency to do this, they likely also have um, you know, things like mailing lists, they have information on who, tines, you know, who tends to engage with what types of content. And again, bringing in that marketing data set could be really useful as a supplement to this. It's interesting to point out, and I think it's bang on, Angel, and maybe if we flick onto the next um, screen, thanks, Danny. Uh, it gave everybody opportunity to uh, take part in this poll because it's uh, what we're talking about here leads us into a, uh, a pretty nice sort of um, uh, segue into our Q and A session, perhaps whereby we're keen to see what people um, are using in terms of data. Because as Angel alluded to there, in that instance, we were using open source data, people's commentary. Um, often when we go into projects ourselves, especially from a, a communication perspective, it might not be related to website development or, or a social media strategy. Often when we're looking at a more traditional communication PR type of project, we often still ask our clients if we can have access to their existing uh, website or marketing channel uh, analytics. So think website, Google analytics, social media analytics, because straight away you've got captured data there, which tells us, who are the people who are actively coming to see you in your online environment? Uh, what are they looking for? It might start to give us a sense of how we start to frame conversations with your audiences moving forward. And I'm going to put my glasses on now because I'm hard of sight. But listen, let's have a look because as we start to see people interacting with this poll, it's interesting to see how and you can interact with every single one lines of the uh, each each of these lines in terms of uh, how often you uh, use this type of data to inform your uh, either your business processes, your communication. Uh, it's clearly looking like maybe your customer data, which probably not surprising is something that most organizations have readily at their hands. And then depending on your skill set or your profession, you then might use other platforms or data sets uh, not as actively. Just to jump in there, does everyone have access to the poll? We also posted a link to it in the chat for ease of access. And of course, this isn't, uh, we could go and have nauseam, I'm sure there's many. We tried to refine these into these uh, six key areas of data. Um, and of course, the interesting point to raise also with that external open data there, what we're seeing is uh, globally, but you know, especially here in Australia with uh, Australian governments, uh, federal and state level and, and local level, uh, New South Wales probably, I would say, maybe leading the way in terms of their open data uh, sets and their policies and strategies, but certainly Queensland governments are also really great at uh, sharing open data, being able to access that again is really great to be able to get a bit of a sense, a bit of a, uh, a, a litmus test in terms of what people think and say and doing um, to be able to inform our personas, our stakeholders and how they might react. Because I guess I mentioned in the intro that we're trying to look at the context by which um, people are interacting with your brand. And if we can better understand the socioeconomic sort of information surrounding our audiences, then it might help us to further refine our messaging and of course in this day and age we can get really refined messaging out to really refined persona groups rather than broad brush uh, messaging which perhaps as, ex as, as communicators those amongst us uh, we were more so uh, used to going through mainstream media all the time as opposed to very precise channels so that's pretty I guess a pretty good split um we've said never and daily maybe daily was a little bit adventurous but certainly if we take that as an indication um, the finance piece, the customer data, the operations data leading the way, probably less so what's lacking maybe is the social and uh, digital media data, which I, I find quite interesting, actually. And depending on how many comms people we have on here, I think being able to access uh, your own data, your own social data, as I mentioned, uh, could give you a great insight in terms of who's engaging with your brand, who's most active with your brand. It might start to give you a sense of 
where your future marketing activities or communication activities might be framed. Certainly, I've been asked in the past, um, you know, by very intelligent people, uh, what, what should we be doing on Facebook or Twitter? And my first response is, well, until I see how people interact with those channels with you, I couldn't possibly say. So really, that's an interesting outcome. And I guess to build on Rob's point, one useful thing about social media data, for example, is that it's generated outside the organization, which means that unlike maybe focus groups or other more traditional market research um, you know, approaches, you already the, the data is already being generated. So if you need to suddenly compare your you know, current conversations with a baseline a year ago, um, you don't need to have set up the data collection from all the way back a year ago. You can just look back in time historically through social media analysis tools. And that can be really useful because in a lot of organizations, one thing we do observe is that um, there are times when organizations have the data already, but there are times when the data they need to analyze isn't quite there yet. And so they might need to then go collect the data before they can then analyze it. That might be something like, you know, net, cust you know, net, net um, promoter scores, for example. They may not currently be serving their customer base. And so to really understand um, net promoter scores, they'd have to start a data collection and then months down the track, do the analysis. Whereas social media, you know, obviously it's already there. And um, that can be very useful, especially in looking into areas that are emerging, say in response to a crisis or in, re in response to trends that you weren't quite expecting at a time. It's also not uncommon, I guess, for us to see this, this spread of use of data. Finance and operations data tend to be the areas where organizations invested um, fairly early on in pulling together the data, getting it accurate for you know, financial reporting, using it on a day-to-day -day basis. And it also tends to be um, harder, more quantitative metrics that, that are involved. Whereas I think when you start to go down that list, the, the data um, can be a bit more diverse um, they might involve areas that are newer to an organization like e-commerce or digital marketing, which may not have, which typically haven't existed for as long as a finance function, for example. And yeah, the social and digital media data, um, we know it's out there, but some organizations might, might still not have the tools to analyze it, or it might be, as Rob was saying, a bit, you know, it, it's hard to know where to begin sometimes, um, especially because there is a lot of noise out there and and the data is also never going to be as controlled or complete or accurate as you know you can get from a general ledger. So the way you use social and digital data ends up being quite different. And we see more and more organizations come to us as well to, to you know, work on how they can make use of this data set. Before we head into the Q&As and open up to the, uh, to the audience for any questions and again, just a reminder, please feel free to use the chat function to ask any questions. Um, before we do head into that, I'm not just round out that by just articulating, just reaffirming, I guess certainly from Roland's perspective, when we talk to our clients about sentiment analysis, it's never um, an and or or situation um, with more traditional uh, engagement or market research pieces. Uh, I often see things like sentiment analysis as a cost effective, always on, uh, finger on the pulse type of check. Uh, what was interesting uh, for one, in one particular instance, we were running sentiment analysis alongside more traditional market research methods, uh, considerably more expensive methods, I should say. Um, and what was interesting for me, and it was more of a validation for me, was to be able to take the learnings from sentiments, implement the hypothesis into a, a small C digital campaign where we were spending small amounts of money through social channels to test messaging, test visuals, test video content. And in the end, it was intended to drive uh, interesting signing of petition, funnily enough. And in the end, we um, uh, looked at a, a typical audience or persona that would be most likely to positively engage with the campaign. And we were doing that in isolation to the more traditional market research, which has been asked to find out exactly the same outcome. And can I say, we came up with exactly this, well, almost exactly the same rationale for the audience that we we would be targeting. But as I've said, um, I would never suggest that it would be an either or. It's, it's ideally you'd be 
adding sentiment to what other data sets you already have. So Kelly, I might hand over to you if there's any uh, questions to facilitate. Yeah, thanks, Rob, and as well, thanks, Angel and Danny, for your um, presentations. So with that, let's kick off the Q&A portion of this webinar. Um, and with that, just a reminder, um, if you do have any questions, um, throw them in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. So let's go over to a question from Jay in Melbourne, who asks, what baseline sentiment dictionary are you using to determine positive versus neutrality, or is it custom made for this industry and gradually improved as time goes by? That's a really great question, Jay, and I might take that one. Um, as you're probably aware, there are quite a lot of um, approaches and, and techniques that can be used to analyze sentiment. Um, in this case, through NetBase, we use a natural language processing base, so NLP based, um, backend. And the reason we took this approach was because NetBase's algorithms are already very much custom designed for this type of data set. So if you're running sentiment analysis over, say, legal documents or parliamentary proceedings, that's going to be very different in nature to social media tweets and, and, and so on. So the, the, the NetBase model is customized for that. But what I might do is, Danielle, quickly take over the screen share for a second. Um, one reason we like to use this model is because as analysts, we want to have some visibility over what's going on under the hood. And we find that our customers typically do as well. And that lets us expose things that might be specific to an industry or to kind of fine tune the sentiment. And so one thing, one thing that NetBase lets us do here, as, as you might be able to see from my screen, is that you can look at individual posts or, or comments that come from social media and see exactly what is driving that sentiment score. So an example here, if you can see the screen, um, yes, that's my favorite fast food burger. This demo is based on burgers, by the way. Um, so favorite is, is highlighted in green. That's the word that's driving the sentiment as positive in this case. In the next line, we've got recommend the Bartlett burger, a delicious, well, so it keeps going, so that's positive. Why do I always want burger? Again, that's, that's the verb that's driving the sentiment. So it's a lot more nuanced than just looking at words that might be good or bad. It takes into account the grammar and the context of, of where the burger is being mentioned. Because if someone is writing something like, you know, I, 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 I love burgers, but the, you know, I love the burgers, but the chips were terrible you don't want to just identify terrible as a sentiment that that's not actually going to be very accurate or useful. So you need the natural language processing in the background to understand what is the subject and verb of a sentence? Are we using adjectives, verbs? You know, what is the language structure that we're using to, to talk about this topic? And with that in mind, what is driving sentiment or up, you know, up or down? And Danny showed something earlier, which was the um, sentiment drivers. And here's another way of looking at it with maybe slightly bigger words on the screen. You know, the green words here, order, eat, want, they're driving sentiment in a positive direction. They're behaviors that indicate that someone is feeling positive about that, you know, a product. Whereas not eat, not want, discontinue, they're negative sentiment drivers. And you can see this play out also for emotions and um, apologies for the expletive there. Um, so you, you, you can kind of see that play out. And we find that this is quite important for um, just understanding where the sentiment is coming from. And also to be able to say, hey, for my industry or my context, I might need to change the sentiment. And so you can do it in individual cases or you can do it in bulk. But that ability to tune the sentiment for a use case, we also find to be quite critical. Um, one funny example from my early days of looking at this was when doing some analysis for an airline and one of the services they have is a bag drop. And so the word drop as a verb is often associated with negative sentiment. But obviously in this case, it's, it, it's a product. So we, we can choose to then look at it as either neutral, which is what we went with, or we can look at it as positive because people are talking about you know, a, a product and it shows awareness of that particular offering. So in short, I guess to answer, in summary, to answer your question, Jay, it is not an industry specific model, but it is a fairly um, 
sophisticated NLP based model that can be tuned for a particular use case, whether that's an industry or say a particular campaign. Wonderful. All right. Well, that leads us then to a next question um, coming from James, who asks, the Wine Australia work is both beautiful and has a very smooth user experience. What BI tool was used to put this together? And do you use a data warehouse behind the scenes or are you going directly to source systems? So that might be a good one for Danny. Yes. Hello, James. Thanks for the question. Um, and thank you for the compliment as well. Uh, we love that. Um, we loved that piece of work. So. The Wine Australia work was done, um, the dashboard itself was built in Power BI. Um, it was used um, to be embedded into the website um, using Power BI embedded and also built off a data model that was actually housed in Azure, uh, in, sorry, Azure SQL Studio. So uh, saying that the source data, source data itself um, was integrated previously prior to when we jumped onto the project. However, what we did was pull the uh, different source data through Azure pipelines um, into a transformation layer where we then um, implemented all the transformations um, in the SQL layer. Um, the reason for that is it allowed us to optimize the queries um, because there is actually a significant amount of data underneath those dashboards. So uh, doing those transformations within the SQL layer allowed us to have a really fast and smooth user experience on the surface. Um, when we built that dashboard, we also built it alongside um, a couple of user experience experts. Um, so we have designers at Agenic that helped us understand what the stakeholders needs were um, and also allowed us to ensure that as a public facing dashboard, it could be used in a smooth way. Um, so I hope that answers your question. But if you have any other questions, we're very happy to share some more information with you. Great, I'll go ahead and move on. If there are any follow-up questions, feel free to pop them in um, the chat as well. Um, I did receive a private um, question, um, so we'll go ahead with that one here, um, which is we've heard about the benefits of combining different data sets, sometimes in unexpected or surprising ways. What's the most unusual data set you've used in this space? Rob, do you want to go ahead and take that one? Yeah, what's the most unusual data set? Um, I guess thing about the work, um, and we've, we've talked about how we can take Wine Australia uh, data for use in terms of Australian produce overseas. That's probably pretty obvious. I guess from my perspective, we uh, rolled out some work for the state government um, around the introduction of e-ticketing around public transport. And in that instance there, we were using uh, human traffic movement. So we were using data sets that um, were historically used in a town planning perspective. And it probably leads on to a good point, which is that often the person's skill set or profession will dictate the lens by which they are looking at the data set. And I was in a room with people who were used to talking through this data set with town planners. And here I am as a, as a wordsmith and a, as a communication person, looking at it from the perspective of seeing how demographics move. And it was tied into um, other data sets from, say, Visa and, Mike and uh, MasterCard around people's propensity to spend money on public transport or other items. And so from that perspective there, we were able to look at uh, particular suburbs. In this instance, um, the potential initial rollout for e-ticketing is going to be on the Gold Coast around uh, the, uh, the light rail on the Gold Coast. And so we could take a, a kilometre and a half bum, a buffer or a two kilometre buffer around that line to see what the human movement traffic looks like where do different demographics live? And in some instances, we, we could say, we know that at this stop, say Helensvale, there's a vast majority of people are gonna be young female retail workers, as opposed to this platform where people are gonna be getting on and they are pinstripe lawyers, middle-aged males, whatever the case might be. Therefore, the digital billboard or the experience, you can then dictate based on the typical user who's gonna go through that physical environment. So. From that perspective, that was really quite illuminating for me to be able to think about how different people within organizations probably control their own little pots of data and they look at that data through their particular lens, but what opportunities are there to share that data with your peers or with your colleagues, uh, whether it's communication, business process, whatever the case might be, because for some of the parts is probably greater. So it's, um, yeah, that was probably the most interesting part, I think. And uh, as I alluded to before, we've seen with open uh, data sort of policies from governments, I'd be keen to see that um, 
been embraced more by by organisations, by by corporates and organisations as well, opening their data to others, uh, divisions within their own business, perhaps. Great, thanks, Rob. I think we have time for at least one more, um, and I definitely want to get to this one from Ross. Um, great question, um, which is the examples today are focused on industry analysis. What sort of approach do you take for an organization? I might start with that one if, if you like. And and to be honest, most of the work Agenic does is with organizations. And in terms of how they analyze this data, it's often in relation to their own brand or their own products. Um, what we often do in say a customer analy analytics context is to combine that organization's internal data and, and, and kind of social data to understand the voice of customer and potentially drivers behind um, set, you know, sale dec purchase decisions or retention. And so what we might do is take, and we've done this, for, for example, for a Queensland-based theme park, we helped um, set up a survey tool for them so they could gather data from, from within their parks and understand you know, how people felt about rides, the food and beverage, um, wait times, things like that. Um, we also had their customer purchase data, so the sales and the actual ticketing as well as attendance. And we had um, over and above that, what was what the conversation was like. And so we were able to um, use those sources in combination to figure out um, how to potentially um, promote certain events they were running and investing in. Um, their events were, were getting more popular in the market and they were trying to figure out their event strategy and whether that could become a bigger you know, revenue generator for them over the time. And so they could use feedback from the events, ticket sale data, as well as all the hype and publicity surrounding the event to fine tune their event strategy. What they also did though, was to look at what was happening with their competitor. And this kind of came to light through, you know, it was a, there, there, there were some, um, there was an accident that happened at one of the theme parks um, a few years back that some of you might remember. And again, in this context, it was useful to kind of compare, you know, the sentiment for the theme park that experienced the accident and the theme parks that hadn't, and to see whether, you know, there was a hit to the confidence in the entire theme park industry, or whether there was an opportunity to, you know, ad address particular reputational elements for a theme park. So that, that was, you know, two different ways of using data within the organization. Um, and I guess, you know, I might actually throw to Rob to see what you have to add. Yeah, thank you. That. I'm conscious of time. So I might just quickly sort of give my two cents worth as well on this perspective. For a lot of what I mean, most of our analysis, a bit like Angel, is for half and half organizations. And it's often we find that we're helping our organizations continually evolve their proactive comms uh, uh, program of activity. Um, if I think about one in particular case for a, um, a council, they are looking at how people are perceiving issues of the day within the context of the works that they are delivering on behalf of their ratepayers. So the obvious one at the moment is COVID, the outcomes of COVID or the impacts of COVID. You know, what's driving public sentiment at the moment? Is it personal health? Is it shared community health? Or is it jobs and economy? Um, often when push comes to shove, dare I say, the economy and the jobs component is not making the headline news, but it's often the driver for a lot of individual perceptions towards what's happening around them. If I'm losing my job, if I'm a small business and I'm really hurting, is that the thing that's really driving my sentiment at the moment? And so in that case, a lot of our work is geared around helping our clients to refine their messaging. Literally, sometimes it's month on month what their topics of conversation might be to reflect public sentiment in specific geographic areas or with specific audience types. Uh, in other instances, we've also used sentiment to really help to refine the nuance around brand development. So often when we're creating new brands, um, we're, we're looking to see what people are saying about either the sector or like brands to see what are the type of verbs, adjectives that are being used that we can start to maybe not necessarily power them back, but certainly start to evolve. Okay, well, how do we present this brand to our publics? So we've, we've used uh, sentiment in so many different ways. And as I say, it's often on a, on a monthly basis, day-to-day -day basis, just to assess uh, where people's sense is of a particular topic, uh, brand, people, place, whatever the case might be. 
Now, unfortunately, we are pretty close to time, we're a minute to go. So what I might do is I might just uh, override uh, everything now and close out, um, I'm very conscious of time. So in terms of today, thank you everybody for logging in. It's a big uh, pleasure to, to co-host this today. Uh, and a big thank you to Angel, Danny and Kelly for, for joining me with, uh, with this event. I hope it's encouraged you to think more deeply about maybe the data you have at your fingertips or within your organization, perhaps in other, other divisions and how you might A, get hold of it and then how you might interpret that either to deliver great brand or business outcomes. So if you have any further specific questions after today's event, um, you've been invited because you're a friend of a junior for Roland, please feel free to reach out to either one of us. Um, I know I'm probably going to stay on for another moment or two, as I'm sure Angel and Danny will as well. But otherwise, uh, we'll wrap up now. And so thanks again and have a great rest of the week.